Okay, so good morning, everyone. I am Jessie Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates. It is so good to see all of you this morning for our, what we believe to be our 25th Advocate Virtual Forum. And I can think of no better way to celebrate that 25th Virtual Forum than with representatives Raymond and Nemus who are joining us this morning. So thanks for helping us celebrate a milestone. Uh, just a reminder that we are recording today's forum to share later as both a video and a podcast. So we ask that you stay muted, but we're taking questions and comments in the chat feature and we will try and pass those along for our panelists to answer if they can. And uh, if not, we will circle back to those later. So uh, I have a four-year-old who really wants to show me something on the tablet. So with that, I am going to kick this over to Terry Brooks. Hey, thanks, Jesse. Uh, I, I think that uh, all 20, well, not, not the very first one, but since the uh, first one, every time we started, we were like, it is so great to see everyone. Uh, it is so great to see those of you who have shown up for 25 straight Wednesdays. How about that? It is also great for some of you who may be joining us for the very first time, but we really appreciate you carving out uh, an hour on your Wednesday morning to be part of thinking about uh, kids in Kentucky. Uh, as a reminder, we try to use these Wednesday forums to bring together folks from across the state to think about common ground issues that are impacting the Commonwealth. So. We've had uh, minority and majority leadership from the state House and Senate on this. You know, we have had uh, Leader McConnell's team, as well as Congressman Yarmouth himself, on these calls uh, around uh, the issues of COVID kids in Washington. Uh, you know, we have had uh, officials ranging from Secretary Friedlander and the Lieutenant Governor to national groups such as the Casey Family Programs, talking about issues that are and issues that are more targeted uh, as they affect uh, kids in Kentucky. Uh, we're moving to an arena where we, we still wanna certainly uh, reference COVID in kids and families, but part of what October means is we're already heating up for the 2021 General Assembly. And so uh, you're gonna see increasingly focus areas around issues that we think are important for kids as that opening gavel falls. And this is a great beginning topic because it reflects so much that we at KYA appreciate. And we're talking about paid family leave. Part of what we really appreciate is that paid family leave, in our view, is one of those win-win-wins. It is definitely good for kids. It is definitely good for families. And it's definitely good for local economies. So what other kind of measure mitigates uh, head trauma abuse and increases cognitive and non-cognitive outcomes for little kids and supports family economics and builds uh, pro productivity within the business community and the local economy. I mean, that's one of those trifectas. Representative Nemus, if we had sports betting, we could actually do a trifecta wager on that and, and have all wins. We, that's a different topic, but I just wanted to reference that. Uh, the other thing that, that I really love about it is that, you know, we at KYA uh, fight the narrative that nothing gets done in Frankfurt because our experience is that elected leaders who do not agree on the day of the week frequently agree when it comes to kids and families. And this is a common ground, common sense, common good item. And it's, it's perfectly reflected in the fact that Republican Representative Nemus and Democratic Representative Raymond uh, are the leaders in this. Uh, Representative Raymond uh, has worked with Jason on this. 
Uh, KYA, as some of you know, uh, uh, is conducting a number of candidate forums. Uh, yesterday in his forum with his opponent, uh, Representative Demas actually used part of his time to commend Democrat Josie Raymond uh, around her work in this. So we love the fact that this is not a Republican, it's not a Democratic, it's not a liberal, it's not a conservative, it's not a rural, it's not an urban issue. It's an issue that's good for Kentucky's kids, Kentucky's families, and we believe Kentucky's employers. So first of all, I wanna thank uh, Representative Raymond and Representative Nemes for being here. We, we really appreciate your time. And I wanna open by, by uh, instead of me trying to do a, a quick 101, uh, uh, I, I would like to invite both of you to kind of give your perspective on what it is about, of all the issues, because uh, y'all are interested in a lot, uh, what about family leave animates you? Because I know both of you are strategic and you pick, uh, you pick your priorities pretty well. So uh, no offense, but since I, I was with you yesterday for an, a half an hour, Representative Nemus, I'm gonna defer to Representative Raymond. It is not related to the fact that she is my representative. So mm -hmm. that, that is not a favored nation status, but, but, my, but my, my representative gets to go first. So Representative Raymond, uh, what about this, of all the different things you're interested in, what, what made that percolate yeah. to the surface? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me and Jason on um, and for talking about this issue and for your all's tireless work, of course. But um, so paid family leave, uh, it's been a passion of mine for some time um, for a few reasons. One, I've lived it. Uh, I've got three kids. Jason does too. And uh, you remember those hazy days right afterward, right? And what sort of stress you were under and what sort of juggling you were, do you were doing. And, um, and I've had a different sort of leave situation with each birth. Um, and so, so always knew that there was a better way to support others. And even if I had certain privileges that allowed me to muddle through it, I knew that other people were having a harder time um, right after welcoming a child to their, to their life. Um, the second reason is what you said, Terry. This makes sense. Uh, I'd never heard that we couldn't agree on the day of the week. That's pretty funny, but um, it's Wednesday, everyone. But um, you're right that this is something that people all over the political spectrum support. And we'll get into the reasons why it supports kids, it supports families, it supports businesses, um, it supports economies. And so um, there, there's not a good reason in my mind for us not to do this. There's a lot of discussion we need to have about what it looks like and how we roll it out and how we make sure that no families are left behind, no small businesses are left behind, these sorts of questions. Um, but it makes sense for everyone. And we'll talk about why. And then the third piece, and this is something that's different than the sort of legislation that I'm usually talking about and pursuing, um, is that, you know, this one we maybe can get done. So it was, uh, and someone correct me, was it 2019 when President Trump signed the executive order granting paid family leave to federal employees? Um, and this was, of course, uh, pushed by his daughter, Ivanka, who's been an advocate for families. And uh, so when that happened, I, you know, I thought, oh, oh like we've got, we've got some momentum here. Um, and I think in Kentucky, we can start building support around it. So those are the three factors that, that made me think that this might be the time for us to tackle paid leave here. Okay. So Representative Nemes, talk a little bit about why you have joined Ivanka and Josie uh, and, and focused on That's this. That's a issue. strange trio. <laughs> uh, well, I, I always like to be around strong people and smart people, and Ivanka and Josie are both that. You know, a couple of months ago when the advocates came to me and asked me to, to get on board and to try to help the effort, um, it, was a, it was a pretty easy decision for me. In 2017, I sponsored the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. And so um, it, this is kind of similar to that bill insofar as it helps, um, you know, like you said, a win-win for everybody, but especially for pregnant mothers and mothers who, who recently had, had uh, their children and obviously for, for babies, for fathers and for the employer. Um, and so it, it became, it's pretty much of an, an easy decision for me. Um, I, I ran for office for effectively two reasons, and these are all intertwined because it seems like, you know, if you look at, if you look at policy in a real way, most things are intertwined. And, and so the two main reasons were economic development and supporting and strengthening our Kentucky families that are, that are struggling in a lot of ways. My wife and I were very lucky when we had our oldest son, who's 14 years old now, um, she was a teacher at JCPS, and she taught the day before Sam was born on February the 1st, uh, 2006. Gosh, that seems so long ago. 
And the day after he was born, she didn't go back to work for 14 years. That was an opportunity that we had. Um, and that's not an opportunity that everybody has. And so um, I think it, 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 especially in the very beginning at Bonnet, Josie said, we remember the beginning of the, the first uh, weeks or so that our kids are born. I remember the first night, Josie, and, and I'm, Sam was crying. So I, I, I was holding him and he wouldn't stop crying. I said, Leslie, and I was joking, obviously, but I said, are you sure we can't take him back? Because I mean, it's just so stressful. Um, and that's what a lot of people experience. And that, you know, that's just a little joke at the front, although it is a true story. Um, and so I, I think it helps the mental health of the parents, which enable them to um, better care for their kid. I mean, heck, we have studies that show that states with parent parental leave, um, the parents read to their kids more years down the line. And so I think it, it, this, is the, this is the opportunity to catapult that parental ch child relationship in the right direction. Um, we know in Kentucky we have far too few um, folks who are who are breastfeeding, and that's not. And if if you choose not to breastfeed, that's great. That's your choice. We have a lot, far too many people who want to breastfeed, but don't feel like they have the opportunity. And this kind of policy uh, helps that. And we know all the benefits that breastfeeding brings. And so this is the kind of policy that makes sense. And I'm I was happy when the advocates approached me, and and then when I when I knew that Josie was um, the leader in this on the General Assembly, it it becomes pretty simple because she's a person that. Um, She's uh, been fighting for kids uh, from, you know, from, from pre-birth all the way up to, uh, well, all the way up, but especially up to preschool, pre, uh, preschool education. And so um, I'm happy to be, to be joining with her and with everyone else. And, you know, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act that we pushed in 2017, I think we finally got passed in 2018 or 19, was um, a Joni Jenkins bill when, uh, when the Democrats were in control in the, in the House. And so when I was asked to join that and to fight with her, it was... Um, it was a similar um, sense of uh, of commitment and and, uh, and happiness, I guess, that I was uh, asked to, to to push that effort. So it's a no-brainer. We'll get into some more of those reasons, but um, this is good for, like you said, Terry, everybody, and um, and that's what I want to do as a as a legislator is is in uh, support our economy and most importantly strengthen our families. Okay, so what I'm going to do uh, is get a little bit larger perspective to, from both of you on one particular issue and then invite you to get into some details as to what some options are, what's on the table, what pushback could we anticipate. But uh, Representative Nemes, I was, I was kind of caught yesterday, uh, your answer around getting into elected office, you really reflected on an autobiographical perspective, which I have a feeling plays into your support of, of this bill. Uh, if you're comfortable, do you mind riffing a little bit about just sharing with folks, uh, you know, that uh, sort of two worlds growing up yeah. and how paid family leave specifically would impact those folks as you and Representative Raymond have already referenced who may be under-resourced? Yeah, so um, I grew up in the South End. My mother and father were divorced when I was two. I'm one of six, I have an older sister and then two younger brothers with a dad and a stepmom and a younger brother and a younger sister with a mom and a former stepdad. And then I have a, a stepbrother and a stepsister. Um, and so I'm one of many. And uh, my mother, my father was remarried pretty closely and, and they've done very well. They were uh, middle-class uh, dad drove a truck for, um, for Pepsi Cola and then bought a bread route. And mom was a single mom for most of the time. And it was very difficult. And so my upbringing was in a lot of ways, um, both sides of the track, so to speak. My mother was a, is a very strong woman, very smart, uh, but she struggled because she was a single mom and then many, many single parents struggle. And my father was able to do better because there were two parents in the home. And so what we need to do in our, in, and I don't say this because I read it in a data set or in a book, it's seared in my soul. We have to do better supporting our families. That's mother, father families. That's mother only families. That's father only families. That's father, father, mother, mother, grandparents, foster, foster families, it doesn't matter. We need to do better in Kentucky supporting our families. And I know that what, what strong families can do because it's my, it's my life. It's, it's uh, people who I grew up with. It's my nephews and nieces' lives. And, um, and it leads to so many things, Terry. I mean, we, we have a drug scourge in Kentucky. I'm not going to go too far down the line here, but this is all related. We have a drug scourge in Kentucky. And that, in, to some extent, is, 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 the, is caused by our families not being supported like they need to be supported. Um, 
And again, don't hear me, don't hear me talking to some Republicans saying the nuclear family is the only way. I'm not saying that. I reject that. But what, but what we need to do is we need to have pro-family policies like the Pregnancy Discrimination Act that, 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 Senator, um, that, that, that Senator, my Senator, Julie Rocky Adams, was instrumental in getting, getting it accomplished. And we need to have things like paid parental leave. Um, this is, like Josie said, this is, um, I mean, President Trump signed it. The Democrats in the House pushed it and the Republicans in the Senate in the United States Congress passed it. Kentucky needs to pass it also. A lot of our states have passed it. And there's no doubt in my mind that this will help where we need help the most, and that is at our family units. We have to support our families all over the place, west end, south end, east end, mountains, it doesn't matter. This type of policy helps everyone. So I hope we can get this passed for state workers and then expand it to county and city and then go private. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Raymond, I, I, one of the things that animates a lot of your conversations is a certain conceptual view of economic equity. Uh, we use the phrase a lot, borrowing from the Brookings Institution around the high price of being poor, that if you're poor, certain things just cost more, that, that there's an opportunity cost. So uh, I wanna, and then we'll get into specifics, but I, I wanted to give both of you and, and I wanna give you Representative Raymond, uh, sort of a, a opportunity to talk a little bit more broadly how this fits into your general philosophy and conception of economic well-being for Kentucky and for families. Yeah, uh, well, first I love hearing Jason's, I love hearing people's family stories um, and wanted to share a little, little bit about mine. So my parents divorced at two as well. And so yeah. I had um, the two worlds, right? Half the week here, half the week there. Um, and, and my mom was struggling for a variety of reasons, alcoholism uh, being the main one. Um, and then my dad had his challenges too, but we lived with my grandmother. And so that was the cushion. That was the buffer. She owned her home in the Highlands. Uh, you know, I'm, I went to certain schools and I made certain friends who lived in certain families and certain homes. Um, and that has benefited me uh, to this day. Um, but I think what we've seen over the last, the experts will tell me how many decades, but we've seen this deterioration of the village, really, of the community village. Um, and so I had a, a grandma to rely on that my kids don't. Um, and uh, so I think so many families and you guys have, I know, been doing forums on uh, the precarious situation with childcare and other factors, but um, a lot of families, even middle class, even upper class families, I know feel like they live on this razor's edge of stability, um, especially when their kids are in the mix. So um, just wanted to share that. But uh, this, is a, this is an economic equity uh, policy. Uh, we know that low income mothers, black and brown mothers, are more likely to be in low wage jobs, uh, service industry jobs, essential worker jobs, um, and less likely to have paid parental leave. I'll say that, that, I was about to say almost nobody, I won't say that. Few people have paid leave. I was lucky finally with my third child that I had paid leave from the University of Louisville. Uh, but, uh, but it's a small percentage of people who have paid leave from their employer. Um, so um, I think it's 25% of women go back to work within two weeks of having a baby. And I reported back to Frankfurt after two weeks of having a baby, but I had you know, a private office uh, and a nanny. So that's a very different situation. But um, you've frozen for me. So I'm just gonna keep talking and hope that you're okay. still hearing me. Um, I think we are, we're good. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, so while the, the issue of lack of paid family leave is affecting all kinds of families, um, it's particularly affecting um, the families at the bottom of our economic ladder. Um, the, Jason's mom, for example, um, single moms, women of color, uh, you know, people who are even less likely than most to have access to paid leave through their employers. And I'll say that the, the Jason and I have introduced um, uh, very similar bills to provide um, paid leave to state employees. And then I have a bill that would provide paid leave to all Kentuckians. Uh, and so I hope we'll get into what the program could look like at the start and then how we could scale the program um, so that it truly does include everyone. Because of course, when we're just talking about state employees, that's a certain class of people. Right. Well, let's do exactly what you said and get into the specifics. Uh, again, I think uh, there, there's sort of a, a tactical rationale that both of you uh, 
had parallel thoughts. You were channeling each other on start here and see what it could grow. So this is, instead of directing it to Jason or Josie, I'm just gonna kind of open it up and let both of you weigh in. Talk about what's on the table uh, in your respective bills and uh, your thinking on beginning with state workers. And then after we talk about that, we'll move to thinking about it in a little bit broader perspective. So uh, it doesn't really matter to me, we can flip a coin. Why don't one of you uh, begin talking about your thinking on state workers, what your bill would do, and then we'll do a compare and contrast here. I'll defer to Josie. She's been on longer and then I'll, uh, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll be at the end and then she can clean up. Okay. Yeah. Ahead, so I think we both think it makes sense to start with state workers. It really mirrors um, President Trump's executive order. Um, so we've seen that be non-controversial um, at the federal level and believe that we can make some headway here at the state level, mirroring that policy. It also makes sense as a proving ground, right? We've seen several other policies that start there, um, and then we're able to learn what works and what doesn't. Um, both of our bills provide for 12 weeks of paid family leave, um, which we feel is pretty important. You'll see some places offer six, um, but we, we feel 12 is pretty important, and it, we've all referenced tangentially like the, the time and the space that you need after your child is born or you welcome a child to your family through adoption um, to get to know that child and to get to know the responsibilities of being a parent. Jason talked about wanting to increase breastfeeding rights. Uh, ladies, that's rough, isn't it? <laughs> Feeding is rough. Uh, and we know that there's phases, right? And that, um, and that it could take more than six weeks to really get in the groove there or decide how you want to feed your child. So, um, so we want to offer 12 weeks to state employees um, and we think this is something that we can get a lot of support on in the house at least. Okay, uh, Jason, follow up on. Yeah, I agree with everything. Josie said. Yeah, I think I, I, there's no, there's no contrast. I, I agree with everything Josie said. I also say that, you know, we, we haven't been able to raise the pay of our state workers for a long time. And this is another uh, benefit to give to them. Um, and I, Josie said something I may want to make sure that we don't just, just, just fly right over it. This is also for adoption and, and foster care. We have uh, significant needs. My goodness, we've got significant needs in the foster care area. And hopefully this will encourage state workers to, uh, to get in the foster care world um, and give them a little bit of a benefit, not nearly what we, what we need to. We need to do a lot more in foster care, which is what, you know, we focused on that in the last four years. But this is another thing that would help, would help in that area. Um, but another thing I'm, I'm hoping in a time where we've got difficult budget issues, of course, it seems like every, other, every year we have difficult budget issues in Kentucky, but post COVID it's going to be pretty bad, I think. But I think we're going to be able to show that this doesn't cost the state much money because the way we budget, right, is, for example, I'm in charge of the budget for the judiciary and the justice cabinet. So let's say the justice cabinet. If you're in the justice cabinet, we give X amount of dollars for employees. Well, we don't, we don't, decide or, or uh, project how much, how much leave there will be, uh, turnover, this, that, and the other. So, so we're already budgeting for this in a, in a sense. And so we'll prove that out and then we'll be able to go to the counties and city much, e much more easily. Um, if we try to get all of it or eat the whole elephant in one bite, maybe, maybe I mean, to say it like that, then we're going to have Keiko and the league of cities, I think being, having a little bit of um, unrest and being uneasy. And they're very, very powerful, as they ought to be, in, in the halls of Frankfurt. And so let's get it with the state workers first and then show that it's working uh, for, the, for the people that we want it to work for. But it also doesn't have the negative conse budgetary consequences that some fear. I'm, I strongly believe that we're already effectively budgeting for this um, because it's, it's, it's in the budget. We don't have to add any dollars to pay for these, uh, this time off. They're already getting paid. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's, I think the reason that, that we just one another reason we decided to, to go with state first and then use that as a jumping point. Okay. So let me ask a question that I, I can't quite figure out. And I hope you guys tell me that the reason I can't figure it out is because there's not an issue. Uh, why in the world representative Raymond, uh, is somebody going to be against it? What's going to prevent this from being a, on the, on the, <laughs> well, uh, on the consensus, on the consent agenda, like, boom. Well, I'll say that um, being in the super minority, I'm, I'm often confused 
about <laughs> what's going on in Frankfurt. But um, no, obviously, Jason and I agree with you, but there's going to be a lot of education of our colleagues um, to the points that like Jason around budget. Like around, around budget. You know, the initial reaction, I think, for a lot of folks is that costs money. We can't spend money. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm used to running around saying we need to spend a lot more money because I'm usually advocating for pre-K for all which has a big, a big new price tag. Um, but as he's describing, this one really doesn't. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of reassurance and education of our colleagues. And we've got to keep talking about the benefits. You know, um, you referenced it, Terry, at the beginning about head trauma, right? But I've got two words, infant mortality. Mm -hmm. Paid family leave decreases infant mortality. And I think if Jason and I all run around the house floor saying that, <laughs> <laughs> saying we're about to save children's lives yeah. um and if we can get people to know that and believe that then it's got to move or i'll be the most confused i've ever been at breakfast okay jason you're not in the super minority so uh the flip side like. of it is uh do you is is that kind of what you see as your all's role as just sort of leader teacher on making sure folks understand in both chambers both sides of the aisle uh why this is a pragmatic move ahead? Is that, is that your sense of it? Or are there other uh, points of opposition that you anticipate? I, th I think, uh, I, I, no, I think that's exactly right. It's about, it's about educating. The initial thought is, man, that's going to cost a lot of money. So we're going to, you know, we're going to educate on that issue. But the beautiful thing about this issue and, and so many issues that we've been, we've been able to, to get done in the last number of years um, that are bipartisan is you can make an argument from all kinds of, you know, you want to, I'm going to overgeneralize here, but you want, you want to do some squishy liberal argument here? You got it. You want to do some, some right wing conservative argument? You got that here too. And you got everything in the middle. I mean, I dare you to make an argument against, against, against the family here um, or, or, you know, when we, when we, when we fashion an argument for the economy, I mean, it hits all the points. This one does. And the most important thing is that it, it, um, is that it is good for the baby. We're talking about mom and dad, no doubt about that. We're talking about the employer, no doubt about that. The state government and being able to attract and retain employees, no doubt about that. But it's good for the baby. And that's what, if, if you run for office and that doesn't at least open your door to the conversation, then you ought, you know, you, you ought not be in Frankfurt. And we know, I know, you know, obviously every senator and every house member and the overwhelming majority of them are there because they want to make a difference. They want to do good. And Josie, with her bill, and that she's been that she's been fronting, and now I'm on board pushing in the same direction. Um, we're giving them an opportunity to do good, and I think people will hopefully uh, jump on board. Now, another thing, because uh, racial issues are so much at the forefront today, is I'm going to you know when I talk to my my colleagues, I'm going to lead with that. Um, it's something that we're talking about in the Republican Caucus. How can we do better? What what policies? This is such a difficult area. But there are some things that are tangible and that we can grasp right now. And this is one of them. Okay, great. So my understanding, and I'll just look for nods, is, is the strategy is let's start with a uh, momentum building uh, pilot demonstration uh, seed idea for state workers. And then I assume what we would see potentially in coming sessions perhaps the 2022, since that's the big budget year, is let's talk about expanding that. Uh, if that's the strategy, uh, I'd, I'd like for both of you to think a little bit down the road. And uh, if, if you were doing some predictions, uh, what could we see in coming sessions? Is it going first to other government entities or to the business community or both? So, approach that conversation either from that economic development or squishy liberal ideas, whatever. Uh, uh, so I don't know if we want to start with squish or the other, but. Uh, okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I want to make one more point that's not squishy at all. Um, okay, non-squishy Josie Raymond. You know, I've said infant mortality should be like, drop the mic, you know, let's pursue this policy. Um, uh, but there's another point that I think is going to be really salient in Frankfurt, which is that paid family leave increases labor force participation. And, you know, in the two sessions that I've been there, uh, I hear that phrase constantly and people are looking for all kinds of answers. And so I've disagreed with proposals from Speaker Osborne and others that, you know, we need to reduce, we need to have a carrot stick thing 
no more like a stick thing of reducing unemployment, um, you know, or reducing public assistance, these sorts of things to get people into the workforce, kind of kick their butts into the workforce. Um, but I'm more on the carrot side where if we remove that parental stress piece that we're describing, right, and we all know it, like I had to like yell at my kids to get into the basement today so I could put on mascara and get the Zoom pulled up, right? Um, when we reduce parental stress, uh, and give people that cushion that they need and that peace of mind for those first several weeks so they can learn how to care for that child and feed that child and know that their job is secure, uh, women are more likely to re-enter the workforce. Um, and so our labor force participation rate has been dropping for about 20 years. Uh, and we know that policies like this support especially mothers of young children to, to continue to work. Um, long term, Terry, long term, um, Kentucky will have paid family leave for everyone. Um, it'll probably be a short-term disability insurance program like you see in California. Um, and that will not just be for parents, you know, because we, we're, we're being pretty exclusionary here when we're talking about new parents. Um, when others say, well, I'm caring for an elderly relative or I myself have cancer or I have a surgery, um, you know, and so why is it not paid family and medical leave, um, a more holistic program? And so, Long term, I think you're going to see a short term disability insurance program. And when you look at what states offer that and how there's a there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. Um, you know, when we're talking about paid family leave for state employees, the, the, the employer is paying, the state is paying um, and we see that the money shakes out with California's short term disability insurance program. It's an employee deduction like we see. Uh, with some other programs. So it can look a lot of ways. I mean, it, it's coming. It's inevitable. Um, but can we lead on it rather than playing catch up in the years to come? Okay, Jason. Yeah, I agree with uh, a lot of that. I think um, to put some numbers on what Josie was saying, the Society of Human Resource Management, which is, you know, really important in my line of work in, in law, um, they say that states that have um, paid parental leave have a 20% reduction in females leaving the workforce in the first year. Um, Josie highlighted a major problem we have in Kentucky, which is our workforce participation rate. We're trying to do a lot of things to nudge that up because when you nudge that up, it doesn't only help that individual and that family. It also brings more money into the local, the city, county, and state revenues to do things like uh, pay for our roads, to do things like um, actually pay for the health care that we're trying to get to people. And most importantly, perhaps, to increase funding to our, um, to our education systems that are, are perennially underfunded in, in, in Kentucky and have been for decades and decades and so, and so it's, it's a good all around. Um, I would say that, that it's going to be difficult. It, I don't think it'll be that difficult to get it to the counties and to the, to the cities. And I think that that'll come in the offing pretty quickly after we get this passed, hopefully this year. I know we're going to push it forward this year. Hopefully we can get it done. But it will be more difficult, obviously, to get it uh, required in the private world. A lot of employers already, already have it. Not all do. I think the way it's going to come ultimately, and I'm hoping that it does uh, more quickly than not, is I think that um, the federal at the federal level, the FMLA um, leave will be will be paid. That's where it is in most developed countries, and uh, United States I think needs to get on board with having FMLA uh, paid leave, which would be better than paid parental leave because it includes parental leave, as Josie was saying, but also it does the, um, the everything else that we need when, when you know all the examples that Josie gave when. Mm -hmm when wife has cancer, you know, husband has, um, has a, a car wreck, whatever, whatever the situations are. And so I hope that's the way we go forward um, as a nation. But if not, then Kentucky needs to keep, uh, you know, nudging forward. And this is, this is the start. One of the questions I have, uh, so again, it, it sounds like there may be uh, sort of uh, multiple chapters, state workers, uh, local local government workers, and then move into the private sector. I think sometimes we fall into the trap, and I'm editorializing, that we, we think monolithically about, quote, what is the business community or what is the chamber's reaction. Uh, the sense I get is there may be some bifurcation between small and larger businesses just because of resource flow on this. Uh, and you can disagree with that, but I'm wondering if you could each talk about uh, what you anticipate uh, the private sector, the business community's reaction. What are the concerns? What are your answers, which I realize you've, you've already given those. Uh, do you see that division or is it regional uh, 
talk just a little bit because that that clearly is something that merits advanced discussion. Yeah, I don't know that that we can um, that we can have that discussion right now with our small employers. I do see Terry a difference or bifurcation between the big employers and the small employers. A lot of big employers already already allow this. Not all clearly, uh, not enough, but but a number do. Right now is not the time to saddle any responsibility, any additional responsibility on our small businesses. We're losing uh, small businesses by the hundreds uh, due to COVID and our response to it. And so we need to, um, I don't know that we need to, to saddle on them any additional responsibility. If, if the state is for this, and we ought to be, then the state needs to put its, uh, its mouth, money where its mouth is. I think we need to have some kind of a tax credit or something to sweeten the pot to, to help uh, especially small businesses when we want to go in this direction. Um, and, and so it, uh, I don't know exactly what that'll look like. Uh, it's going to take uh, them coming to the table and, and helping to craft that policy. But, but I don't think now is the time to, to, to have any new policy or requirement on, on small, our Kentucky small businesses. We need to get them back up and running. Yeah. Josie? Yeah. I don't know where the Kentucky Chamber is on this issue, uh, but I know that the Kentucky Chamber is a huge supporter of kids. Um, because that makes workers more productive, more efficient, uh, and happier. So um, I, I had a great conversation, Jason, with our colleague, Representative Adam Bowling, who's a young father and a small business owner, um, about this. And he educated me about these concerns. So he was explaining that um, small businesses are already having trouble staying competitive with their large corporations. You know, what's, what's paid parental leave at YUM? It's, it's a lot. Um, and so I think uh, that when we're talking about supporting small business, it's not a matter of not putting things in place that benefit families and that benefit the workforce. It's putting things in place that can help small businesses stay competitive. Uh, and so that would be the state stepping in to support families in this way so that small businesses are able to provide this benefit and stay competitive with larger corporations. So. Um, I think if we can get, if we can get it to state employees, you're going to see the demand, right? The volume of the demand, uh, go up as we see the value for, for all kinds of employers. And, you know, he, I think he'd be okay with me telling you all that he's got pharmacies, right? And he said, well, you know, I, I could cover it probably for my pharmacists, but then I wouldn't be able to afford the replacement employee. So these are the sorts of considerations that, that are coming in, but he also had the misconception, Jason, that it'd be all on him. And I said, we've got all kinds of ways to structure this, employee responsibility, employer responsibility, state responsibility. Um, and so it goes back to that education piece. So it sounds like for folks who are wondering where this is going, they, they obviously can count on something this session around state workers. It sounds like that potentially the next move will be other government workers. And what I'm really hearing is that how quickly or unquickly it expands to the private sector probably is based on a lot of other issues, COVID uh, recovery, et cetera. Is that a, is that a fair assessment from what I'm hearing from y'all? I think so. I think at the state level, I, you know, I'm curious what could happen at the federal level. If mm -hmm. the presidential election goes a certain way, if the Senate, if the power in the Senate tips a certain way, um, is it going to be one of those policies that's done at the federal level and then trickles down to the states or is Kentucky going to be left to design its own? Okay, good. Well, one of the things, uh, while we are, uh, as you all both know, we're, we're paying you all a, a high honorarium to, to be on this, like the hero. So we, we've got to add some value. And uh, I want to, I got two other themes that I, I want to tackle before uh, we get a hard stop. So uh, this is our honorarium substitute, which is I want to give you just a little margin along with paid family leave. I have a feeling that both of you have some other priorities in your head that you would not mind a little airtime. So uh, could you take just a couple minutes? I'm going to try to do better than Chris Wallace and monitor the time. But uh, maybe take a couple minutes uh, and let each of you talk about along with paid family leave. Here's a couple other things coming from Josie Raymond or Jason Nemus that you'd like for the folks on this call to know about. Uh, Representative Raymond, you want to you want to open since you already uh, sent me one about a follow up on the breastfeeding anti discrimination bill. You want to talk about that and maybe one other one that you're going to be pushing. No, that's not a big on um, 
the pregnancy action from Jason and Representative Cheek um, to make sure that once people have children, they're, uh, they're, they're able to breastfeed, especially in the higher ed environment. It came some, from some nursing professors at UK. But, um, a couple things that I'll tell, has anybody here heard that I'm really interested in pre-K for all? Really? Nice <laughs> You know, I, I don't want to be like a one note politician, but but you've maybe heard me say this is actually the silverest bullet to end generational poverty. So I think that's a pretty good note, right? Um, I truly believe that if we would provide high quality, full day, state funded pre K to all of our three and four year olds, um, that we would create a stronger a stronger Commonwealth. You know, we know it's good for kids. It has lifelong outcomes. Like the children of children who go to pre K are healthier which is just astounding to me. Um, parents have less stress. We're talking about the parental stress in the first 12 weeks after the child is born. Like Jesse, when they're three and four, you're still stressed, right? Uh, so it reduces parental stress, increases labor force participation among women with young children. Um, we saw it jump more than 10% in Washington, DC when they put this in place. We know it's good for the economy too. And I do know where the Kentucky Chamber stands on this one big supporter. Um, and, and then I'll throw out one other policy that I'm working on for next year that's exploratory, and that's to create a baby bond program in Kentucky. Um, and what this would do is basically establish um, child savings accounts for each baby born in Kentucky. Uh, and, and money would be contributed from the state each year based on family income. Um, that's sort of our best metric. This accumulates until the child is 18 or 21 and then can only be, it's a trust essentially and can be only spent on, on wealth creating activities like college tuition or buying a home. Um, and because it's based on family income, you know, Jason's and my kids might not get anything or they might get five bucks uh, per year, um, but families who really need it, um, this money would go into the child savings account and the parents can't touch it. It's just for the children, for the next generation. Um, and this would do a whole lot to reduce the racial wealth gap that we're seeing. So again, this is a, a racial equity. Great, thanks. Representative Nemes. First, I wanna say I'm happy that when my son came in here and got something off the printer, he's a freshman in high school, he had a shirt on. I mean, that's, 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 that's <laughs> Second of all, let me, get, let me get serious real quickly. <clears throat> did you hear what Josie just said? I mean, did, you listen to what Josie's talking about. This is why it's so important that we don't devolve into what we have become in Washington, D.C., because Republicans and, different, and Democrats, we think a little differently, and her thought process is important, and we need to work together to get those things accomplished. And so, you know, so anyway, I was excited to hear, I hadn't heard about the baby bond program. I think it's, a, I think it's an, excellent, an excellent concept that we need to push forward. And, there's, and it's not just Joseph. We've got McKinsey, who does a lot of good things, Nima Kulkarni. There's a lot of people who are, are people of good faith that have great ideas that we've got to, we, we have to do better working together. So my, I'll, I'll say two things that I'm, my priorities for this coming year. Um, you know, in Louisville, there's a super majority of Democrats and in Frankfurt, there's a super majority of Republicans. And I'm the only person from Louisville on the Appropriation and Revenue Committee in the House of Representatives. And because I'm in the super majority, that gives me uh, a little bit of I'm in the room where the decisions are made. Let me put it that way. There are nine of us that are in the room. I'm in the room. And so my number one priority is to protect our home. Um, they, we have 100, 100 legislators, 18 from Kentucky, only three Republicans. And so everybody wants, when they're in that room, and that's a super majority room, obviously, they want to take care of their own. It's not, a, it's not an animosity toward Louisville per se, but it's they're taking care of their own. And so I have to be in that room taking care of our, our home of Louisville, not just the 33rd district, but the South End, the West End, Old Louisville um, as well. And that's roads, that's everything else. You know, there's, there's a, an effort to change SEEK funding in Kentucky. And while I want to put more money in SEEK, we cannot allow SEEK funding to be changed tremendously because what that means is Oldham County, which I represent, Anchorage, which I represent, but most importantly, JCPS, because there's 97,000 kids there, we're going to lose on a SEEK reformulation. So anyway, so I'm at that table. So I, my number one priority is always to protect my hometown of Louisville. Um, the second thing, and this is not related to, um, to, to the KYA's issues per se, but, but I'm, I'm such a true believer in, 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 uh, in this issue. I've got to, I got to talk about it everywhere I can, and that's medical marijuana. Uh, when I ran for office four years ago, I wasn't for it. I've never used an illegal drug in my life, um, but I met with a, a group of constituents in Crestwood, and they talked to me. And they were regular folk that looked just like us. They weren't just trying to get high. They were trying to be and feel better. And they convinced me that I was wrong. 
And now I'm fighting with everything I have to bring medical marijuana to Kentucky because it will make our people better. It will make those people who are hurting better. I'll, one quick story, Terry, and I'll shut it. I was walking in Anchorage and I came up to this 87 year old man's home and he's, he was living alone and he was 87 years old and he's a Republican. That's all I knew about him. I could take it to his house and he was, so anyway, so I knock on the door and say, I'm Jason Nemus running to be your state representative for re-election. And he says, he stops me and he's a big six, four, six, five guy. And he says, aren't you that guy pushing marijuana? And I kind of played it up a little bit. And I thought I was going to defend myself with the argument, right? And tell him, not, <laughs> this is medical marijuana. Here's why it's good. Terry, let me tell you, this man, I'm not going to tell you, he started crying. He started bawling. And he said, thank you, because my wife, and he told me a story about his, recent, his wife who recently died. And, and he said, and I'm getting a little bit up, up, he said, she couldn't get off the couch. And our two sons who no longer live in Louisville come home and they brought their mom medical marijuana and it allowed her to live in her last days. Who do we think we are as a government to get in the way of that family providing for that mom? We need medical marijuana in Kentucky and I'm gonna fight like hell to get it. Okay, thank you so much. So I wanna end with a question and, and we have a, a heterogeneous group uh, on these calls. So, and my KYA colleagues know I'm barely able to use a cell phone. So I'm, I'm lucky to just see the screen in front of me. So I see folks like Mike Hammond and Mandy Simpson, who they, they know as much as I do about advocacy. But I'm also really excited that some folks who are kind of new to this arena join us every week. And I always try to be very intentional when we have elected leaders on posing the question. I, I'm on this call and y'all have sold me. I am on fire with paid family leave or medical marijuana or was your thing early childhood, pre-K, something like that? It's a pre-K for all. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, something has touched <laughs> me. Something has touched me. What, what do I do about that? Cause, cause I, I want to be uh, engaged. I want to make a difference, but I'm not sure where to begin. So Jason, can you talk about uh, both what impacts you and what impacts your colleagues uh, in terms of influence and decisions and priorities? Yeah, sometimes people don't believe it, but it's, it's the gospel truth, and that is contacting your legislator. Um, I like to hear from everybody, but especially from constituents in the 33rd District. You know, I always say I love everybody, but I love those people a little bit more. Um, <laughs> elected officials, they got to get elected. We want to get reelected. And so we need to hear and, and, and fight for the things that our constituents care about. And so contact your legislator and try to find if, you know, if, if the person that we need to touch, just for example, is I'm going to say uh, Attica, whatever, or, or McKenzie, whoever it is, get somebody from Attica's district and, and take that person with you and educate them and have them speak with Attica um, or Jerry Miller or whoever, whoever else. And, and, and they'll open most of us almost to a person will open their, you know, will respond to emails or open their doors or meet you for coffee or whatever. People don't think that's true, but it is, um, especially in the house level where we're so close to the, to the people. And so um, that's what I would say, you contact your legislator. It does work, it's important, but contact them with a, with a constituent. And, and let me say, the calls are important, but the calls sometimes don't get to us until, you know, very late. Um, I don't understand why, but there's a delay that does not come to our office that goes to the constituent service and then gets related to our office. So I think emails are, are much better um, than, uh, than, than, than the calls just to the, just to the hotline. Or that, that, those are good too, but not as good as emails. Okay. So Representative Raymond, how in the heck do I influence you? <laughs> um, well, you know, you're an influential figure, but... Um, <laughs> I, I agree. Contact your legislators. I mean, I, like Jason said, I think people think that we're overrun or that we think we're, we're the high and mighty, right? But um, I'm in sort of a sleepy area in Hikes Point and J-Town, or at least it's been sleepy so far, despite my best efforts. And, uh, and we don't, I don't get that much communication, really. I mean, if I got five heartfelt emails from my district, uh, you know, I would really be paying attention to that issue. Um, you know, we get a lot from, from the bots, right? And we know the support levels in our district, but when people share their stories, um, that, that's really meaningful to me. So I would say beyond contacting your legislators and asking them to jump onto this bill or, or contacting us and asking us, you know, how to work with that person, um, is to organize your neighbors and your friends and also to share your story or to find others that we can share. Because that story that Jason told on medical marijuana, how powerful is that? 
uh, and that moved him and now he's using that to move others. Um, and you know, uh, there's been women in my districts who have shared incredible stories about the, the impact of pre-K on their lives. And now I'm able to share those stories, leverage those with the media and so on. Um, and so that's how we're, we're getting support. I talked about, we're trying to educate our colleagues on the data, um, but we also need to touch them with these sort of personal stories. And anytime we can get help gathering those, we would love it. Josie, let me, ask, let me ask you a question real quickly. I was on recently with um, Sheila Schuster, and she asked this question, and some, one of the legislators said, a personal letter, you know, handwritten. I received a few of those, but not many, but I thought to myself, I remember reading those. In particular, I got, it took more time. Have, have you received a personal handwritten letter, and does that, I think maybe that's effective. From my district, I haven't gotten many. I'll get some from other places. And then, and then I do make sure that somebody, that, you know, are you handling this one? Are you handling this one? Because the person, uh, it does make me think the person, you know, really, really, really needs some support. Yeah. If they take the time to do that. Um, you know who we don't hear from very much? Children <laughs> and teens. <laughs> I mean, if Jason's son contacted me about a school project, I'd bend over backwards. Um, <laughs> So, so that's another angle we could go at. Note, note to Seth, have Sam uh, lobby Josie. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you all so much. I wanted to just reiterate, because uh, we've been pounding this the last couple of weeks, uh, I wanted to, to hold up again that we didn't just hear from Representative Raymond that five contacts made a difference. Uh, we heard that same number from Leader McConnell and Congressman Yarmouth. So what I want to hold up is what we've been holding up, which is that there is so many reasons that Washington is not acting on the next chapter of COVID relief. We can talk about the Supreme Court. We can talk about the election. Folks, y'all know, especially those of you who are in early childhood and child welfare, that if action doesn't happen now, we're looking at a daggone disaster, especially in areas like childcare. So we're gonna to continue to hold up that notion that none of us on this call gets a pass. All of us have a congressman and all of us have two US senators. Uh, as y'all know, uh, links are posted on KYA website. And my guess is somebody from KYA is going to stick up something on the chat now about look at this link. I hope I'm not. Uh, but, but I want to just uh, emphasize that, that we've got to have you making those calls because if we wait until after the election, it's too late. And we understand that the election and the Supreme Court confirmation is our big time consuming, suck the attention, take the air out of the room. Uh, we really want y'all to remind our elected Washington leaders that COVID and kids is happening now, not just after confirmation or election. So that's my amen, but the final benediction belongs to Mahek Cholera. Uh, Representative Raymond, Representative Nemes, I just wanna thank you again for uh, not just paid family leave, but both of you are real champions for kids. And we, as well as everybody on the call, appreciate your smarts and your courage on that. So Mahek, I'll kick it to you. Thank you, Terry. And thank you, Representative Raymond and Nemus for joining us today for a robust conversation. And I do wanna just say, it's so refreshing to hear key policymakers have cordial conversations and also have a moderator that can actually ask a question. So especially <laughs> after last night, this was very helpful to hear and refreshing. So thank you both and thank you, Terry, for moderating. Um, so just some reflections that I took away out of this, this conversation is paid family leave strengthens our family, our family structure, and also benefits a, the economy. Really, it's a common ground bipartisan issue. Um, it also, there's disparities when we're talking about paid family leaves, especially for the low income families and families of color. And this, this net first mo um, step that we could take as a state is really building 12 weeks of paid family leave for state employees. Um, and there's hope, at least what I took away, that there, we can move, move on from that. Um, and we could really dive into a common larger goal, which is paid family medical leave. 
And so I just want to again thank you all for joining, especially your advocates for joining our 25th um, weekly advocate forum. Um, and before I sign off, I just wanted to point out a couple other reminders. Um, since we're talking about legislators here today, um, we are holding Children's Advocacy Week, um, which used to be just Children's Advocacy Day. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to engage with your legislators on policy. And that's coming up February 1st um, through or, yes, February 1st through the 5th, um, 2021. And we hope that all you advocates here on the call today joining us um, can be a part of that week. And um, we'll have that in the follow-up email as well as, um, as always, we will have a recording of this forum. Next week's forum, we're gonna be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on um, families experiencing domestic violence. So please be sure to check in on that one. And as always, we have our Action Hub. That is our one shop shop to really highlight the diverse set of federal and state priorities impacting children and families. So with that all being said, we will see you next Wednesday. Have a great day.